sound rolling? We be rolling. And hating, patrolling and trying to catch me running daddy. Catch me running daddy, trying to catch me running daddy. Dear Hollywood, attachment wounds and nervous system dysregulation. Today's podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, I have something really special to share before we get into today's episode. I spoke at a convention for a chronic illness recently, and I met someone who works at BetterHelp, uh, the online therapy platform, which I personally used actually during a breakup a few years ago. Um, anyways, we stayed in touch and I shared how this podcast is dealing with mental health and a lot of really intense themes. And they actually came on as the first sponsor to give you and this entire community 10% off your first month with my link, betterhelp.com slash Allison Stoner. Like I said, I can vouch. I signed up years ago after my previous partner had a mental break and turned violent unexpectedly. And I needed to both exit the relationship immediately and also process the confusion and hurt. But the process was so simple and straightforward with BetterHelp. I matched with a therapist in a few days and I immediately set up a session. I love that you can message them 24-7 so you don't have to hold in your thoughts and feelings until the session. And they have a range of options um, for speaking with your therapist. So you can really tailor it to what works for you. So if this podcast has been stirring or there's a particular life event you're experiencing or you're just like, it's time. I'm so grateful to share this opportunity. Therapy is the reason I'm alive, that I'm healthy, that I'm joyful. You deserve to experience the same. So thank you to the team at BetterHelp and use my link, betterhelp.com slash Allison Stoner. You can find it in the description. Let's get into it. Hey, welcome back to Dear Hollywood. Today, we're digging into my favorite topic of the entire podcast, the nervous system, and specifically for kids stars, how the entertainment industry lifestyle affects a child's nervous system, which subsequently influences the course of their life, health, and relationships. I'll share some of my own journey, and then we'll zoom out to a few different factors that all child stars experience. Given this episode centers the body and we tend to be quite a disembodied society, I thought it would be important for us to practice connecting to our bodies first so we can listen from a deeper, more grounded place. If this doesn't feel right or safe for you, or if you're driving or in a space where you can't check in in this way, just skip ahead a couple minutes. Otherwise, if you're ready, take a moment to find a comfortable, relaxed position, preferably seated or lying down. And from here, let's just release expectations for a moment. Maybe plant your feet on the surface below. Feel your body supported by the chair or bed under you. And let's, of course, take a couple deep breaths. Maybe letting the exhale be a little bit longer than the inhale. Just your natural pace here. You also don't have to be perfectly still if you want to stretch a little bit and bring your focus to your body for a moment. Feel free to do so. Just another deep breath. Nice and slow exhale. Excellent. So we'll do just a quick body scan to notice what we're feeling in different areas of our body. You might notice thoughts or emotions or sensations. Maybe you'll notice some areas are tense or feel more or less mobile. Let's just get curious about how we're feeling in this moment. So starting at the top of our head, just bringing your focus to what's going on upstairs. Maybe noticing your facial muscles and if you want, relaxing them as you stay connected to your breath. And just ask yourself, if my thoughts were moving at a speed 0 to 100, what speed are my thoughts moving right now? Just let them move on by. Notice what else is happening, maybe in your neck and shoulders. Scanning to this area, bringing your attention to this part of your body. And just noticing, where is there tension? Where is there tightness? If you want, you can take a nice deep breath, breathe into that area, and start to soften and relax a little bit more. Nice. And let's slowly just scan down the middle of our bodies. So noticing what's happening in your arms, in your hands, 
but also your chest and your back and your abdomen. What's going on in the center? Any sensations? Maybe some emotions that you've been feeling throughout the day, but you're just now really letting them come up. Just notice without judgment, there's no right or wrong. And if you'd like, you can take a couple more deep, deep breaths into the middle body, maybe expanding your body a bit more on the next breath. And a long exhale. And relaxing and softening just a little bit more. And now let's scan to our lower body. So just bring your attention gently to your hips and let it scan down your thighs and knees, shins and calves. And just notice what does this part of your body feel like right now? What's going on there? Again, if you want to stretch or if you even want to make physical contact to help yourself connect with your body, if that feels safe, go for it. And now let's scan into our ankles and our feet, just feeling our body connected to the floor or surface under you. And see if you can invite a little relaxation, a little more softness into the lower body. Letting go. Letting whatever bubbles up come up and then letting go. Just take one more deep breath here, checking in with how you're feeling, noticing your experience and what it's like to slow down and be a little bit more present. Excellent. Feel free to wiggle and maybe even shake it out and start to bring your attention back here to the conversation. Please, if you're feeling like you need to take a nap, definitely take a nap and then come back and listen to the rest of the episode. Thanks for trying that with me. This simple process called a body scan can help us slow down and listen to what's present. Um, this is one of many tools that I now have in my toolkit to help regulate my nervous system. But I have to thank my first therapist for introducing me to these somatic skills because they really changed my life. If you didn't notice, the typical mental health solutions primarily focus neck up on what's happening in our mind and brain but the stress and anxiety and trauma we experience are playing out in the body. And by the time I was a teenager and under so much stress without these tools, my survival response was just to dissociate and disconnect altogether. So I want to share a little bit about my experience. You can get to know my nervous system. At a young age, um, I was actually diagnosed with something called alexithymia, which means I literally couldn't identify or sense what I was feeling in my body, emotions or sensations. I also couldn't communicate my emotions, which I know is ironic. I was a professional actor who couldn't feel. And no, this doesn't happen to everyone, but in my experience, I survived by living neck up and just intellectualizing my emotions instead. I mean, let's be honest, I'd severed trust with my body so long ago. In the industry, I never listened to it when it needed sleep or food or a break. I never checked in with how I was feeling or the impact this lifestyle would have on my health. My body was just a thing I lugged around to do whatever I told it to do. Well, after a while of ignoring all the messages and becoming more and more numb, it actually started backfiring and acting. During auditions, I hit this emotional block where I couldn't access feelings anymore. Not happiness, not grief, not anything. It's as if my body said, nope, no more contorting into a million shapes on cue. Give us a freaking break to process one small thing at a time. What was missing in my upbringing and training was building awareness, understanding, and trust with my body, and knowing how to help my body feel safe and calm as I moved through all these industry experiences. And this truly has been the most impactful healing and resilience building work I've done. My therapist, being the incredibly compassionate and patient human she is, knew that at 16 or however old I was when I started this work, I already had a lot of stuff that was swirling around in my body, unfelt, unprocessed. 
She knew that we'd have to move extra slowly, as you do with drama, knowing that, you know, it's going to be one step forward, two back, three forward, one back, two diagonally. It's a very delicate dance, but the healing is so, so worth it. Week after week, she invited me to notice where in my body I was feeling emotions or sensations, just like we did earlier. And I'd have to ask her for help to notice that my jaw was clenched or my hands were in fists. I'd get so flustered for my lack of vocabulary for my own experience. So she'd help give me options to describe the shape, size, color, location of an emotion. And it took me years to really drop down because... My body had become convinced that nowhere was safe, not even with the person whose job it is to help me support myself. So it took a lot of time. But these mind-body tools saved my life. And this set me on a course of studying the mind-body connection, getting certifications of my own, learning about other groups of people facing specific kinds of trauma related to the body. My book, Mind Body Movement, simplifies the process of reconnecting with yourself. And my company, Movement Genius, provides these tools created by therapists that you can use anytime, anywhere to really manage life, to really feel better in your own skin. So I am particularly invested in today's topic of how the industry and high-performing lifestyles can affect a young person's nervous system because it's going straight to the core of who we are. Your nervous system literally controls your movements, your ability to see, think, breathe, respond to the world around you. And we're all carrying some kind of story in our nervous system. So I invite you to be curious about your own experiences and patterns as you listen the story you carry about yourself, others, and the world. This isn't just about looking for trauma. There are also beautiful things to discover, some wins and perks of our childhood. Some people, you know, we get to thank for being supportive presences, like my therapist. So we're going to cover topics like chaos versus routine, attachment wounds, high-pressure environments, and um, survival strategies that we all might use from time to time, like dissociation or denial. All right, I know I've been loading every episode with so much information, so I'm going to attempt to cut straight to some main ideas about how growing up in the industry affects a child's nervous system and overall development. Starting with the absolute chaos that is entertainment. The industry, Hollywood, is a highly unpredictable environment. As actors, we are at our agents and productions beck and call. So for child performers in the industry, they lose the structure and consistency of routines that are so important in early years. Instead of going to school at a similar time during the week or having a general evening routine and bedtime, even eating the same foods. You are getting called to set at a different time every day. You're leaving at a different time every night. And each day you have a unique workload, just like each set has its own culture and different personalities, different rooms and spaces. Sometimes school on set is a tiny trailer. Sometimes it's in a giant warehouse. Sometimes school is outside under a tent. And you just never know when you're going to get these last minute appointments for auditions or callbacks. So you're just constantly uncertain about what your life looks like, which also means it's really hard to make commitments outside of the industry because everything is subject to change. Now, this lack of structure, this life of chaos and last minute scrambling and perpetual novelty, it might have some perks. It might have some downsides. So let's talk about it. Some perks could be that you become highly adaptable because you have to be. I've moved over 25 times and I am just now 30. It can also greatly diversify your early life experiences, your exposure to people, places, and ideas. I mean, it's incredible that I got to judge a film festival once in Osaka, Japan, and that I got to perform at the NAACP Awards with Faith Evans and Angie Stone. Yes, This white pasty kid at the NAACP Awards. It was a tribute for Serena and Venus Williams. Like, what? I'll also never forget touring South America, 
Those were the first shows and first crowds who knew the lyrics to my original music and chanted my name, even though I was just the opening act. So these are special, special, special moments. On the contrary, this lack of consistency for a young person can really lead to challenges with feeling safe landing anywhere and feeling secure attaching to anyone. If you're unfamiliar, there's something called developmental attachment categories, not to be confused with adult romantic attachment styles. And it refers to the way infants and children respond to early experiences with primary and secondary caregivers to manage their own inner experience and the relational connection. We are social creatures, born needing caregivers who help meet our needs and regulate our physiology. Keep in mind, you can have different forms of attachment with different people, and they can adjust over time, so we're not stuck. But these early experiences do meaningfully influence our manner of relating and behaving in relationship. I'll list the categories, but I'm not an expert, so I suggest looking at the research from Bowlby, Ainsworth, and later Dan Siegel. In the U.S., about 55-65% to of the population have secure attachment, meaning in your early experiences, you felt seen, soothed, and safe. As a result, you can trust fairly easily, you're attuned to your emotions, might have good self-esteem, and you can have healthy interdependent relationships. Next, about 10-15% to of the U.S. seem to be ambivalent or resistant, meaning in early experiences there was inconsistency and uncertainty. When you signaled a need, you weren't sure if your caregiver could comfort or not, and it revved up your nervous system. Later on, perhaps you struggle to communicate directly or feel self-doubt, reluctant to get close, nervous that someone doesn't love you and distraught when relationships end. Next, about 20% of the population show avoidant attachment, where in the first year of life, the caregiver was either missing or misperceiving the child's signals and needs and didn't respond effectively or promptly. So over time, the child learned to stop expressing needs, to just shut down even. Later, they may be self-reliant and hyper-independent, may not lean on relationships much, or be able to share thoughts and feelings. They might recoil or drop offline if there's conflict. And finally, there's disorganized attachment, which reflects a lack of clear attachment behavior. It might be unpredictable or volatile. It may happen in response to having a caregiver who was supposed to be comforting but was also a source of distress or fear. Whether they just felt frightened by not knowing how to soothe you, or maybe they were directly hostile. As a result, a young person may have compromised self-esteem, apprehension in relationships, maybe they even take on a parental role as a kid. So we find that our early experiences with humans have informed our working models of attachment. But remember, you can have multiple forms of attachment with different figures. Well, for child performers, the industry itself kind of becomes its own metaphorical attachment figure for us because of how looming and pervasive its presence is in our lives. Between all the interactions and situations and messages we absorb in the industry, it sets standards for how we relate to others. And the chaos and inconsistency has really done a number on this one. One of the things that I've realized as I've gotten older is just how much I carry a feeling of abandonment that I don't believe originated just from my parents' divorce or not seeing my dad after seven. I think some of it, a meaningful part actually, stems from the repeated experience of bonding deeply with casts on set and then breaking those bonds after we wrapped and saying goodbye forever. As a child, the message I received as I bounced from job to job is that everything is temporary. Everyone will leave soon enough, even if you call them family and share deeply emotional experiences together. No one is going to be there for you consistently besides yourself. So if you want or need something, you'll need to handle it yourself. Deep bond, deep break, deep bond, deep break. I just stopped opening up to people, and I certainly didn't expect anyone to stick around. To this day, my knee-jerk response is self-reliance. Further, I was moving frequently and traveling for work, so for many years, I didn't really feel settled or rooted. 
And I developed this way of existing in a space without ever landing there. I'd literally sleep on top of sheets, not add anything to pantries or refrigerators. I'd avoid using the shower. I'd leave places as if I was never there. I actually remember at a certain point, I just stopped unpacking and I lived out of suitcases and boxes. So this constant change and hyper-independence have made me, yes, pretty damn resilient and resourceful, but do I want to only rely on myself? No. Do I want to struggle to trust others this much? No. I would love to just say, hey, I've noticed you're consistently behaving in trustworthy ways. Like, maybe I can build trust with you. Nope. It's more like we're dating for a few years or I'm living somewhere for about a year and then people are like, oh, that's so lovely. Are you starting to settle down? And I'm like, no. In fact, I was just thinking about leaving. Moving on to another area, setting boundaries. As you know, when children don't have clear rules and standards across spaces, they don't get a chance to learn clear boundaries around what's right and wrong or normal versus questionable. They don't even know if they're testing limits because the limit does not exist. And the industry is a bit of an, you know, anything goes work environment because every creative project has its own rhythm and leadership team and literal storyline. So imagine what it's like to work for a new company every few weeks or month for the next 15 years of your life. You're constantly figuring out the rules, the people, your job. And for actors, there's no onboarding or company training module. You're just on set, expected to gel with the cast and make this project. Well, for a child, this is so much information input and so little structure at such an early stage of brain development. How do you think they're making sense of this experience? Now, building off of unpredictability, the industry is volatile. The highs are really high, the lows are really low, and many days have both highs and lows. I mean, we're making entertainment, right? People rarely write films to be boring like the average day in life. Characters go through big stuff that we're tapping into when we audition. Or if we're on tour, for example, we're performing in arenas full of people, all eyes on us, adrenaline coursing through our veins, rounds of applause, meet and greets, flashing lights, loud booms, and then... The tour ends and it's silence. No fans, no dopamine rushes, no three-hour shows. And often, performers and crew members fall into a post-tour depression because what goes up must come down. Many performers get sick or sleep for weeks or isolate to recalibrate. So now that I've been away from the industry for a few years... It's taken a lot of intentional effort to calibrate to a life that isn't just this endless cycle of peaks and valleys. And when you're a child and that's your baseline, it's common that you just continue unconsciously creating those kinds of patterns in your nervous system as you get older. You know, maybe you find yourself in intense relationships that keep you spinning. Maybe you constantly push yourself to the limit. Or perhaps it leads to burnout and you crash. And what a great segue to talk about chronic stress. The unpredictability plus volatility equals a lot of stress on a nervous system. Now some stress is good, some stress is necessary for growth, but incessant toxic levels of stress can damage a child's developing systems. It can lead to major health issues, <clears throat> like all the conditions all of us seem to have now, and it can create real challenges with establishing structure and balance in our lives as adults. I have met with a dozen doctors and alternative health professionals over the past several years to figure out what's going on with so many of my systems. And while there are speculative diagnoses and treatments for temporary relief, to me, I'm still reflecting on how this connects back to my earlier experiences and development. I believe deep improvement is possible and I also know some of this I have to accept as natural outcomes of my early life experiences. Just do the best I can with it. Let's add another layer to the cake. Unrelenting pressure. Let's name some of the multifaceted pressures that high-performing children experience around the clock. Continual training. Perpetual competition. Harsh criticism. 
adult roles and responsibilities, body image, fame, media, maintaining career momentum to avoid becoming irrelevant, and one of my greatest monsters, the fear of falling behind. When you are the youngest to succeed, the first to make it the top of your class, and your whole life has been a string of accomplishments that were particularly impressive because of your age, like for me being the youngest person to teach a masterclass at a renowned dance studio, there is an accompanying pressure to stay ahead. Who are you if you're average? This fear alone has led some young talent to completely spiral and even end their own lives. I distinctly know that by age 14, I felt the clock ticking. I had four years to find a pathway into acting as an adult, or I would be left behind and forgotten. I could feel my peers pulling ahead in the race. My specialness and advantages had an expiration date, and I knew it. I tried honing as many skills as I could. I tried to book projects on as many theatrical pathways as possible, indie and mainstream, drama, comedy, horror, all while compiling these clips of non-Disney projects into a reel to show casting directors, look, I'm more than Camp Rock. But it didn't amount to much. The big agents were still passing on representing me. I wasn't booking any breakthrough roles. I was terrified that I'd turn 18 and I'd be starting over again in a sea of adult actors, and I wouldn't even have a normal education as a backup plan. Just so we don't think that I'm only here to complain, I promise you I'm not, I do want to point out a few perks of growing up in this kind of pressure. You can develop incredibly thick skin. My friend recently told me that my tolerance for pain and discomfort are so abnormally high compared to anyone else he knows. You also figure out a way to muster through obscene amounts of criticism and threats. I mean, people throw shade every single day and somehow you develop a part of yourself that's like, that's all you got? A Reddit forum that starts with, Allison deserves to rot in hell for brainwashing children into homosexuality? (laughs) Then you can also become, yes, a fucking brilliant artist and child prodigy if you're practicing 10 hours a day and all the ducks are lined in a row for your success. You can hone your craft and be exceptional, record-breaking, awe-inspiring. Just good luck living up to that as an adult. But you possess the American Dream winning combo of grit, work ethic, and notoriety so you can truly maximize your potential. And if you play your cards right, you'll be set for life by 18. But on the flip side of being groomed to be an icon, this means we kid performers, Michael Jackson, anyone, are wired for workaholism. And because our society values achievement and competition so much, this often doesn't even register as a need for intervention. That is, until the kid burns out or screams for help in some way. And many do. Or they push themselves and develop substance issues and health problems. This kind of pressure is also the recipe for perfectionism. Come on, a kid actor can't make mistakes. They can't goof off, can't look bad in public. Further, they don't want to. They are tormented by their own need to nail every line and outdo themselves. Perfection is a part of their identity. Failure is the enemy. Dissatisfaction, a wretched companion. We are basically wired for anxiety, and as I mentioned in other episodes, most, if not all, of the adults around us are focused on who we are as performers, not whole individuals, so there may be very few spaces where we can express other mental and emotional experiences that we're having. I look back at my younger self that I've meticulously deconstructed for 10 years, and I'm baffled by the obsessive workaholism. I'm amazed and often sad that I didn't quit sooner. So we've got unpredictability plus volatility plus pressure for high-performing kids in the industry. I want to pause and ask a few questions to stir the conversation. Where do you think we should draw the line when it comes to professional or high-level performance lifestyles for children? What does it mean to demand excellence of them? And at what cost? Obviously, there will be a lot of different perspectives on this. How does this early entrance into full-time work hours 
perpetuate the existing hamster wheel of our adult workforce and workplace? How does it give these kids a leg up on everyone else entering the workforce, perpetuating inequity? Is it even possible to reimagine industries another way where we're not just rewarding the workaholics and overachievers and overlooking everyone else? How much stress should we impose on a child and expect them to tolerate? At what point is it strengthening capacity and resilience? And at what point is it destructive and counterproductive to their development and longevity? Leave some thoughts as I continue sharing a few more of the effects of the industry lifestyle on a child performer's nervous system. Let's talk about the moment that the kid's body decides all of this is way too much and just goes into a state of dissociation. Now that we have language for it, more and more young performers are coming forward and describing this experience as a pillar of their early years. For example, Raven shared that they don't even remember working on most of the Cosby show because they were dissociated. Their performer self took over and in some way their real embodied self went offline. Here's the thing, dissociation is a survival mechanism that children and adults use when their basic needs for safety and attentive connection aren't met. And hear this. It is common for children to continue dissociating even once they're in a safe place again. Meaning, this defense mechanism doesn't turn off. Now over time, a child who is frequently dissociated can actually have an impaired memory. Their memory can become quite fragmented. They might have flashbacks to bits and pieces of an experience, but they may also have entire periods of life that are just blank or inaccessible. For me, I wish I could tell you what it was like working on all the jobs at some of the highest moments, and yet I have a very spotty memory. Timelines can be really tough, recalling situations. Sometimes I see jobs that I forgot I even filmed. So on the one hand, dissociation is this biologically brilliant strategy that aids the child's survival, on another, it can persist into adulthood and even splinter off into complicated behaviors like having trouble focusing, living in denial of their experiences, or in some cases, splitting into different personality sets like dissociative identity disorder. Another state that I want to name and claim is denial. This is something that I'm just now coming to terms with, um, which is that I've been living in a lot of denial, and I know I'm not the only one, but I was trained to only ever recite one very narrow, skewed version of my life story, one where I never said what was happening behind closed doors, never spoke about the negatives, and I'm realizing as I've gotten older that I've hurtfully bypassed not only my own suffering, but other people's suffering, because I've built this muscle of denial and avoidance. For years, I wouldn't acknowledge any of the pain. I wouldn't even say something hurt. I'd dismiss it as if something just didn't bother me, didn't happen. We as a society see examples of denial everywhere, in spiritual and religious circles, with social issues, the environmental crisis. Humans have a great propensity for lying to ourselves and others, and it keeps the old story intact, stifling our growth, convincing us that the safest approach is to just keep up the narrative as is. The sad thing is, I'm 30 and I'm just allowing myself to name and acknowledge the rest of the story. Not just the good stuff, but also the bad stuff. It's painful, but it's honest and it's necessary for healing. And so much liberation has happened since I started doing this. It's necessary for me to accept that some things happened to me that I didn't want, I didn't choose, and that have left long shadows on my life. It's also necessary for me to hold some other people accountable, not just myself as if I were the only responsible party in this. Is this journey to transparency something that only kid performers experience? No, no, it's human. But the point I want to make here is that denial and dissociation and all the other aforementioned experiences and health issues are commonplace for child stars. And more directly, their causes and effects of trauma. So we have to include all of this in our analysis of the toddler to train wreck pipeline. Okay, 
There's one final big factor that I've named previously, but I'm going to highlight again, and I'm going to go into much greater detail on its profound effect on the nervous system, and that is abuse. Extremely unhealthy and abusive things happen to child performers all the time in Hollywood. For example, as mentioned, young people are being exposed to drugs and drinking underage by industry executives or team members. Some even find themselves addicted before they can drive a car, fundamentally altering their brain forever. When I was pursuing music, one of the creative directors in my orbit shared that he knew of a girl group who had just signed with a label, and as they began rehearsing for their first tour, they had a meeting with team members who pushed a bag of cocaine across the table and said, you're going to need this to get through the rehearsal schedule. Literally, getting minors or anyone for that matter, addicted as part of the job description. Another kind of abuse is sexual abuse. Many artists who are minors are overtly sexualized and coerced into sexual experiences they do not want to be in. And yes, that means harassment and assault and rape. Some are forced to perform certain acts by people who are manipulative and predatory and have some sort of power over their career trajectory, In this moment, I'm reminded of the horror stories I've heard about young people being told that they can make it big if they sleep with someone, and if they don't, they'll be blacklisted. Young artists are sometimes groomed for years and not even aware that this is their experience because as a kid, it seems like they're just getting a chance to, you know, grow up fast and be cool and do what adults around them are doing. Sleeping around, partying, living the Hollywood lifestyle. And this happens in all sorts of ways. Like sometimes you have a meeting scheduled only to find out the location of the meeting is someone's hotel room. Sometimes you're filming on location and there becomes this open door for adults to have sleepovers with kids. It's gross. There's also this disgusting culture of kids being love-bombed by adults. It's, it's not okay. But let's recall the power dynamics here. The young artists are not given a roadmap that includes and emphasizes their bodily autonomy. Their bodies are products, instruments, things to be used for others' entertainment. They're being lavished with attention as if they're the star and it's all about them but they also feel the threat of being completely disposable and replaceable by the agency or label, and they need to ensure their spot by continuing to impress and comply. They're not even cognitively equipped or legally able to give fully informed consent in many areas. Even if they say that they're granting permission in a moment, it's not the same as fully informed consent. These are all ripe conditions for abuse. And in addition to drugs, drinking, and sexual harm, there are, of course, other kinds of abuse, like financial, emotional, psychological abuse. We've named how prevalent this is, so let's face the reality of the effects of abuse on a child. I really want us to hear this. I'm pulling this directly from childwelfare.gov. It's about how abuse corrodes physical health. Abuse increases the chances of diabetes, lung disease, malnutrition, vision problems, heart attack, arthritis, back problems, high blood pressure, brain damage, migraines, chronic bronchitis, cancer, stroke, bowel disease, and chronic fatigue syndrome. It's also associated with certain parts of the brain failing to form and function properly. Parts related to emotional processing, decision-making, and motor behavior. Effects of abuse can manifest as educational issues, low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, trouble focusing, PTSD. It also is correlated to a higher rate of suicidality. There are also higher rates of attachment disorders since it's difficult to form and maintain healthy and secure relationships thereafter. It can also lead to behavioral issues like unhealthy sexual practices, criminal behavior, alcohol and drug use, and perpetrating the abuse on others. All right, so while we may, at face value, view child actors as pampered and privileged, 
they're also a group of people who are severely underprotected in critical ways. And it takes quite a toll on their nervous system and development. So that's why I want to improve industry conditions to better protect them. Feel free to take a couple of deep breaths. I know that this can bring up so much. And I also know that young artists aren't the only ones who have experienced abuse. Many of you listening have your own stories and trauma that you're healing through. So I do want to hold a little space and just name that you did not deserve what happened to you. You are worthy of loving connection. You are deserving of healthy support. This wasn't your fault. And if you need a moment to gather yourself or to reach out to someone, please do. Please take care of yourself. Coming up, I'm going to hyper-focus on specific, unique, fascinating experiences that young artists have, starting with the psychology of auditions. But uh, first, I just want to leave you with a question this time. Just out of curiosity, how are you feeling about watching entertainment with kids in it now? Comment your thoughts and then head to the next episode. See you there. On the next episode, the majority of your time and energy, if you're lucky enough to be selected, will actually be spent commuting across town, plugging parking meters, and finding hole-in-the-wall rooms to audition in front of casting directors. In fact, there's a saying that auditioning is actually the job, booking a role is the vacation.